Colorado Republicans react to the Alabama upset with relief and nothing to see here. Answering your questions about how much of your taxpayer money goes to disgraced politicians. You're also demanding more details about CDOT's plan to have you pay for every mile you drive. The simple idea of a seat at the table for every veteran packs a restaurant. We've all been there and done that. Giving children the simple gift of a Santa that looks like them. And we kick off a season full of your holiday fails with a kid who did not consent to being in the Christmas concert. Next. Another police department's facing questions about when its officers are allowed to fire into moving vehicles after two people were shot, one of them killed in North Glen this morning. You know, Denver changed its policy and cut a fat settlement check after a teenager was killed in a similar incident in the city. Here's what we know about what happened in North Glen. Four officers are on routine leave after this shooting. Police say that they approached a stolen car near 104th and Marion when the driver sped toward them. Officers then fired at the car. Now, presumably one person was driving, but two people inside the vehicle were shot and one of them died. We checked North Glen PD's use of force policy, which says that shooting at a moving vehicle is, quote unquote, rarely effective. Their policy does allow an officer to fire if there's a person in the car with a weapon or if the officer feels he or she has no other way out of the situation. Denver officers are no longer allowed to shoot at moving vehicles unless other deadly force is being used against the officer. In Denver, being in the path of the vehicle is no longer a justified reason to shoot. Denver changed its policy after DPD officers shot and killed Jesse Hernandez in a stolen car nearly three years ago. That sigh of relief you heard in Colorado when Republican Roy Moore lost in Alabama, that was coming from our Republican Senator Cory Gardner. Brandon Riddiman explains how the tide that rolled last night could wash over Colorado. Cory Gardner was harder than many Republicans on Roy Moore, publicly calling for Moore to be expelled from the Senate if he'd have won. He gets to avoid that dogfight now because Moore didn't win Alabama. Doug Jones did, the Democrat. After the race was called, Gardner had an odd take on that, writing, I hope Senator-elect Doug Jones will do the right thing and truly represent Alabama by choosing to vote with the Senate Republican majority. Well, that earned some jokes, even from fellow Republicans. Interesting spin here, wrote GOP operative Roger Hudson. Recruiting a newly elected Democrat to vote Republican? Let me know how that works. Hashtag hypnosis. Hashtag waterboarding. Hashtag charm. The morning after, Gardner put a finer point on Alabama. This isn't a rebuke of conservative values or agendas. This is a rebuke of a candidate. And he's got a point there. Alabama still is a deep red state, but there's also a fight for the heart and soul of the Republican Party that's primed to jump from Alabama to Colorado. Moore got a lot of help from Steve Bannon, the conservative blogger who served as advisor to President Trump. He helped Moore win the primary, and the president followed suit by endorsing Moore. Bannon's declared war, his words, on mainstream Republican leaders, and we could see it play out in Colorado's race for governor next year. Our own conservative firebrand, Tom Tancredo, says he's been talking with Bannon about trying to beat more mainstream Republicans here next year, which might help explain why the state party chair today called on everybody to move on, writing, the more energy we spend consternating about Alabama, the less we'll have for Colorado. For next... I'm Brandon Riddiman. Our next question came in from a few viewers, including Robert and Sherry, who wrote, do these disgraced elected officials who resign because of sexual harassment allegations still get to collect their pensions? Our Verify team found the congressional pension system really does put the grace in disgrace. Democratic Senator Al Franken will keep his payouts after resigning over sexual harassment. So will Democratic Representative John Conyers. Republican Congressman Trent Franks will not. However, it's not because Congress is concerned about coercing your staff into being pregnancy surrogates. Franks doesn't get a seat on the gravy train because he's a few months short of the required five years of service. To lose a pension, a member of Congress has to be convicted of one of 31 specific felonies. So even former Democratic Rep. Anthony Weiner, who's locked up for sexting a 15-year-old, he's got a taxpayer-funded pension waiting for him when he gets out of prison and turns 62. So exactly how much of your money do these disgraced politicians get in pensions? Well, you're not allowed to know. It's almost like there should be a law against... Oh, wait. Never mind.
I'm meteorologist Kathy Sabin, tracking two storm systems and a chance for measurable precipitation. Much needed snowfall across the area tonight. Oh, there won't be a lot in Denver, but in the mountains, maybe two to four inches of snow overnight tonight. And any amount of moisture during the morning rush could complicate things a bit. Snow already beginning in the northern mountains. There are no advisories to speak of. It'll be a fast moving storm. It'll move from the northwest to the southeast, producing a quick blast of snow in Denver after midnight, lingering till about 7 a.m. and then clearing out. Tomorrow will be a cold day, kind of a raw day with that northwest wind. While temperatures will be seasonal in the 40s, that north wind will make it feel more like lower 30s. And so tonight, increasing clouds and wind with snow developing after midnight are low in the mid-20s, which is where we start tomorrow. Mid-morning clearing, a little bit of light snow above 6,000 feet could stick for a short time. And then it's just going to be a chilly afternoon ahead of a nice warming trend Friday and a second stronger storm that could actually bring a better chance of snow and certainly another round of cold for Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, the clouds are out there, but the Geminid meteor showers peak tonight. If you can find a break in the clouds, look to the northeast, Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. So we lit up the lines of communication you guys did after Marshall Zellinger's report here last night on CDOT's test of a per mile fee for driving instead of the gas tax. Tons of questions, stack of them. Really good ones, too. So I warned you that you're going to see a lot of frowny faces or angry faces come across the screen here. And right on cue, you vented like a millennial during our Facebook Live this afternoon, where we answered your questions about CDOT's test to charge drivers for every mile instead of a 22 cent per gallon gas tax. One of your questions still unanswered, what about drivers from out of state? How would they pay for every mile they drive? It's a question that we take very seriously, and that's why we partnered with 14 other Western states to do group research to get right at the heart of this question. Yeah, I'd be remiss if I, told, if I made you believe that we had all of the questions answered right out of the gate, but the reality is that we're in the beginning stages of research, and this is one of those key questions that we're trying to answer. Another question was about emergency responders, like volunteer firefighters, or even someone driving doing some charity work. Would they have to pay for their miles? Who would receive a carve-out and who wouldn't receive a carve out if anyone would receive a carve out is really the purview of the state legislature, that forum for which our elected officials can come together and debate the merits of those questions. And a popular response to CDOT was, why do you need more money? Spend yours more wisely. The cost of goods and services are going up. The revenue that CDOT is collecting uh, to pay for the roads is going down, and the demands on the system are going up. Over the next 25 year period, we're going to have about an average annual shortfall of about a billion dollars, so $25 billion over a 25 year period. You hear that? It's the other argument. What about the pot taxes? Oh. Brandon Ritterman, Kyle, has already covered this extensively. But long story short, pot taxes go to pot enforcement, school construction, and state and local general funds. And CDOT generally doesn't get general funds from the state. If we didn't answer your question here, check out our Facebook Live archive on the next Facebook page because we only talked for 37 minutes, Kyle. Jeez. Honey, why didn't you wash the dishes? What about the pot taxes? <laughs> All right, thank you, Marshall. I thought the state of Colorado was supposed to intervene and stop people from getting offensive things on their license plates. That's wrong. How in the world do we allow that? Raiders? Come on, DMV. What's going on? So they actually gave us an official response. Your tax dollars at work. Hey, we asked. Quote, while we wish we could deem that offensive, we are confined by statutory authority. Go Broncos. End statement. We'll meet a Colorado who spent years building a Christmas collection that reflected her family. Now that they're grown and gone, she wants to share it with you. The first of our holiday fails, a kindergartner who was not having his concert, and he was in the front row. Then we'll grab a meal with men who have promised not to let others be lonely. Next. Christmas is celebrated by families of every culture and ethnicity, but let's face it, the people in Christmas decorations are mighty white. A Coloradan who lives in Aurora has spent decades building a Christmas collection that reflects her family. With her grandkids now off living on the East Coast, her wish this year was to share it with someone new. You. We're entering the Christmas season. It's an exciting time. It's a true celebration. My whole family is big on Christmas, so as I learned the true meaning of Christmas, I started collecting angels and nativity scenes. I have a collection of Santa Clauses that are mostly Afro-American. Oh, 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 Merry Christmas! I wanted my kids to see faces that represented who they were and to be excited about a Santa Claus that 
looked similar to them that they could relate to. <laughs> so I've been collecting for 35 years. I started collecting when my mom gave me an ornament, I think when I was 17. My collection has grown. There was a couple of years when my kids were young. We would probably get 10 to 20 a year. Our last count, I think we were at about 426 angels, and that's just the angel ornaments. I definitely think that we're pushing probably over a thousand in different ornaments, angels, and Santa Clauses. <laughs> There's a lot. I think that they should be enjoyed, they should be seen. And I think kids should have that opportunity to experience Santa Claus and angels that look like them. Tanya's collection, which we saw there through the lens of our photojournalist Corky Scholl, has now outgrown her house, so she has it on display at the office. All right, gather around, children. It is time for a story of holiday fails, because it's the thought that counts. Andrew Apodaca got real. He told his parents he did not want to be in his holiday concert at the Clayton Partnership School in Thornton, but they still stuck Andrew in the front row, green shirt, red bow tie. Mom Jennifer said, Andrew, just move your lips, baby. Do, do the hand motions. Like hell I will, Andrew clearly thought. So he stood there like a stone, song after song. <laughs> We have blurred out all of the other children for their privacy, but I'll be honest, that's pretty much what it looked like when we were watching it crying laughing in the next office today. You do you, Andrew. Although he did ask his mom later how he did. She told him so-so and he cried. When your best holiday plans fail, come on, have some fun. Share them with the rest of Colorado. Email next at 9news.com or just use the hashtag HeyNext. We're taking the wrapper off a new segment here highlighting uncomfortable honesty and one veteran sitting alone led to 100 sitting together. Next. Imagine if the TV news covered as many acts of good as acts of evil, like the incident at the Timnath Walmart, an ambush of sorts. That just sounds dramatic. This is actually an act of good. Jimmy Ann Pope was at the Walmart with her two sons yesterday. A husband and wife walk up, hand her an envelope, and walk out inside 65 bucks and the note you see right there. We would like to share our happiness in celebrating our 65th wedding anniversary, December 21, 1952. Jimmy Ann rushed out to the parking lot but could not find that couple to thank them. She figures that the last thing that they want is any kind of public recognition, but she wanted them to know just how much the gesture meant to her family. It is a story that we hear far too often. Veterans who return to civilian life with a lot to talk about and feel that few people are listening. Our Steve Steger and photojournalist Chris Hansen went up to Loveland, where veterans find a sympathetic ear. Quiet is often considered a cure for a weary mind. You find it here on Saturday mornings. There's starting to be a few show up now. Peace, even when the solitude <laughs> starts to fade. There's always something to talk about. Pass by the Loveland Golden Corral. Tell him he's got to keep taking his meds, man. And Charlie Nash will greet you at the door. The camaraderie. With a crowd this size, you might think they were giving something away. <laughs> These folks gave plenty. You better start learning how to take your meds, buddy. Hence their name. <laughs> Proud American military veterans, Pam Vets for short. A group with a standing appointment for breakfast every Saturday morning. And we all have the same purpose for God and country. Pam Vets doesn't have exact numbers, but they say over the years, about 600 different veterans have traded stories over plates of eggs and bacon. It's just unbelievable, you know? 600 different veterans owe this time to one man. Oh, he'd love it. Who is no longer with them. He'd love it. Virgil Horton would meet with other World War II vets at a small table at the McDonald's just down the road. We, we owe him a lot. He thought a veteran should never sit alone. How are you doing, Charlie? Good. Coffee? Yes, please. If you ever served, you had a seat at the table. Virgil come over and said, hey, you don't need to sit over here. You belong over there with us. It made this struggling Vietnam era and, uh, vet feel like he belonged. Their family. These are as close as my real family 
hard to say how much this group means it's just, to him. Yeah. Charlie yeah. thinks Virgil would be proud. His group that once met at a small table. Corey, where are you? Now takes up most of the restaurant. How many did you say was here this 117. Huh? 117. And the mission has stayed the same. You come here, you talk to people, and you can be up front with them because they went through the same thing you have. Someone's always there to help no matter the era. I was in the Army in uh, 1956, right out of high school. Bob Stubblefield thought he'd never return to Colorado after basic training at Fort Carson. But health did what health so often does and forced him to move back here so his daughter could care for him. He knew no one until he found Pam Vets. It's been wonderful. His daughter brings him here whenever he's up to it. She wants to get some veterans around her dad and take a picture because she's not so sure how much longer her dad's going to be around. The visits are fewer and further between these days since Bob entered hospice. You know, when I went over and talked to him the other day, we know where he's going. It's okay. He won't be in pain. He won't be anything. I mean, he'll be with the Lord. See? These men and women find peace without solitude. The veterans, you know, just a bunch of great guys. I'm proud to be one of them. They sit together. I miss Virgil. Yep. Yep. Because Virgil was family. They sit together because someone once told them they always have a seat. And that's what we have here is family. For next, I'm Steve Stager. What a gathering, huh? The group of vets meets every Saturday morning at the Golden Corral in Loveland, right when it opens, 7.30 a.m. I have to tell you again, you're welcome there. It is a sign that just wrecked everybody in the office. I'm telling you, it's fantastic. Plus, we're going to get into some uncomfortable honesty when we return. It's a sign, and it is one that I'm not going to read aloud, so you have to look up at the TV for this. Kathy Wymore spotted it at the Lamar's Donuts at University and Highlands Ranch Parkway. Missing a few lit letters there, Lamar's, and all of a sudden it sounds like they are selling a dish that is a lot more exotic than donuts. Kathy sent it to the hashtag HeyNext. With her very first tweet, Kathy said, I've never sent one before. Couldn't tell if it worked. You bet your llama nuts it worked, Kathy. Good work there. We're starting a new segment tonight called Next Salutes Uncomfortable Honesty because the AMC Orchard 12 theaters in Westminster could have just said that they were closed for the night. They could have cited a mechanical issue, but they went full on uncomfortable honest in the sign spotted by next viewer Charlie Mitzi. Restrooms overflowing and exploding. Our thanks to the Orchard 12 employees who cleaned up the exploding restrooms and, and thank you for the honesty. Called yesterday, the woman who answered up front said they're back open. Asked about the exploding toilets. If they were gross, she goes, yeah. Jack writes in, <laughs> says that uh, we teased that segment yesterday and didn't do it. He said, I thought you would never tease. We try not to tease, Jack. I honestly ran out of time. We don't tease, we promise, and then we deliver. If we ever fail to deliver on a promise we make to you, I expect that I'll hear from you. And I'll see you next time.